This is good. I think we've got audio. I think we're rolling. How you doing? <laughs> it's time for a q and A. I did one of these back in back in March, and it was such great fun. I shot that one in the Olympic Park today. We're on the glorious Wanstead Flats, one of my favourite places in London. It's about an hour before sunset, so we're slightly fighting against the light here. The sun, you can see, setting between these two oak trees directly in front of me. This is something that could have to be split up over two videos, but let's dive in. Let's not waste any more time. Thank you so much for everyone that sent any questions. Whatever I don't get through in this video, I'll do another one that I'll possibly upload during the week or in a couple of weeks time. So let's, let's dive in. I'll try and do these in, which the, in the order in which they were submitted. Great questions, by the way. Really good questions. The first one. Um, I've lived in London my whole life. Where is a scenic hidden gem? Well, it says, where is scenic hidden gem location? So we've got a plural here. Uh, you think most Londoners haven't been to, i.e. good for a picnic or a summer walk. It's really interesting, actually, because a lot of the great open spaces in London are not very well used, actually. And even here in What's the Flats, which is quite urban, and it is actually a very well used place. There's lots of football pitches here, lots of people walk. You can see look, there's, no, there's no one around me. And it's a beautiful day. It's going to reframe the camera slightly here. I'm a little bit off frame. That's better I'm centered now. I think to take all those things into one um, into one answer, I mean, one of the great hidden gems actually is not far from here, it's Wanstead Park. And I know like people that live in Wanstead use Wanstead Park a lot and it is well used by Wanstedonians, Wanstonians. A lot of people actually even in Leightonstead have never been. It's amazing how many people I talk to around here have never actually been to Wanstead Park. So that always um, slightly surprises me. But um, if you want all of these things combined, summer picnic, lovely summer walk, a bit of a hidden gem that not many people go to, one of my favourites is um, Worley's Park. I'll link to a video below. Um, and it's got the Boudicca Obelisk. The field where the Boudicca Obelisk is, is amazing. It's a beautiful meadow. It is, um, it's metropolitan open land, so you can go there. Um, and it's got a wood along one side. It's slightly outside of London, uh, outside of Greater London, but it's accessible to Londoners quite easily. It's a lovely walk through Epping Forest to Worley's Park. Link below to the video. And you can go in the, in the meadow where Boudicca's Obelisk is, and it's got its stunning views. And then on the other side of Worley's Park, you've got where there is like a temple folly type thing on a hill. And that's just stunning to sit on that hill uh, with the folly behind you. If, if it's a really sunny day, you can take in the shade of an oak tree there. And that's just, oh, it's just magic. That's where I would go for a summer picnic uh, and a lovely summer walk. I think you mentioned something about it being romantic, maybe. So thank you for that one. Big fan of your channel. Next question starts. Always a good start. Um, I know you're a big music fan. So do you ever listen to music whilst out walking? If so, what do you enjoy listening to? I don't, very simple answer to that one. I don't listen to music when I'm out walking for a very simple reason is I want to be present in the landscape. I want to be present in the environment that I'm in. I don't want to introduce anything into that environment. So I want to have my mind clear. I think it's very important to be alert to your surroundings as well, particularly in urban areas. And if you're in outdoor areas like this, there's so many beautiful sounds to take in. Very soon, hopefully we'll get a bit of bird song as the, as the nesting starts, the evening nesting chorus. That's really beautiful. And the same person uh, follows up with another question. Of all the walks you've done, which is your favorite and why? Impossible question to answer. I don't have a favorite walk. I, I think you'd be surprised if I did, wouldn't you? Um, the walks that I do most often, even when I'm not making videos, are uh, up the Lee Valley. So that's probably my favorite territory for walking is around the Lee Valley. So I'll, I'll get as close to that. And there's lots of, I think I've got something uh, over 30 videos here of walks in and around the Lee Valley. And I would include Epping Forest in the Lee Valley region. The Stort Navigation is a walk that really sticks out in my mind as a, as a favorite walk. Uh, I walk over Wanstead Flats all the time and around Wanstead Park and I really love it around here. So yes, thank you for your question. Ah, this is a good one. I can't answer this, but I really like the fact that it exists. This is from Raj. Um, your Van Gogh's London walk with Ian Sinclair, did you notice the ghost at <laughs> two minutes, 20 seconds? I didn't. I didn't. There's a ghost in that video. Another one, easy, well, say easy. I'll have to find the actual answer to this. Uh, what's the most steps you've done in the day when out on a walk? Love the videos. The most I've recorded was, it was 40 something thousand. I, I basically walked 32, 
point something miles, 32.9 miles or something. That was last summer when I had a bad back and I couldn't sit down. And I realised that walking actually eased the pain. So I thought, I'm just going to have to walk all day. I might as well turn it into a thing. And I walked from uh, Leytonstone to Hertford in Hertfordshire. And that was a beautiful walk. And it, by the time I'd finished and got to the station, well, actually, I think by the time I got home, I'd done 30 2.9 miles or something and I think that was 42,000 steps or 44,000 steps something like that I'll put the the figure up here if I can find it and again link in <laughs> link to that video below oh so this is um, a fundamental question what got you into walking around London and doing YouTube have you always lived in London is there anywhere else in England you'd like to live or even move to in the future so there's a few questions within that question I'll try and be succinct in my answer um, what got me into walking around London? What got me into walking around London really was when I first moved here as an 18 year old. In fact, not very far, far from where we are now. I came up as a student to study and I, in, as an 18 year old, I lived in a terraced house in Forest Gate, but just off the Romford Road basically. And um, yeah, I grew up in the Chilterns uh, in a village near High Wycombe. And I always walked as a kid, but then also when I started going out and about, going to pubs and all the rest of it, I would also walk then. And um, so walking was just based on the way I got around. It's the way I understood my environment. It's very natural to me. So when I moved to London as a student down in the city, it was natural for me to walk everywhere. So that's really what got me into it. And then I realized just how seemingly infinite walking around London was. You know, you will never, you will never know it all, you know, and there's so much to explore and so much to discover. Um, I wanted to keep doing it. So that's what got me into walking around London. Codifying it in a way that you see it now really came when I came back from um, backpacking. When I went backpacking in my, in my 20s and I went traveling, I went away for a few years. I did the kind of usual things like jungle trekking and all the rest of it. And then when I got home, I wanted to carry on. I thought, well, why stop exploring even though you're staying in one place? So I basically, when I, even to this day, when I go out walking, I go out as if I'm, I'm going out jungle trekking, basically. I even have some of the same things in my bag. I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to slightly follow the sun around. You'll have noticed a marked difference in the brightness <laughs> of the shot now because I've moved. So I've got more sunlight on my face. It was getting a bit dark over there, wasn't it? It was also quite near the path where people are walking their dogs. There were a couple more questions contained within that original question. Have I always lived in London? I didn't grow up in London. I grew up out in the Chilterns near High Wycombe. I lived in Sydney for a few years. I've lived in Italy for a little bit. In terms of living in the UK in my adult life, London's the only place I've lived in the UK as an adult. And the only other places I've lived have been in Italy or Australia. So consequently, no, there isn't anywhere else I've ever thought of living in the UK briefly flirted with the concept of doing that when I came back from living in Italy because I really liked um, Bologna and uh, to a degree Modena where I'd lived. And I thought, oh, I wonder if there's anywhere like that in the UK. But then once you settle back into London life, I mean, London's pretty unrivaled really. So I, I, I don't think about it to be honest with you. Aha, this is a good question. Um, if someone wanted to do a Lost Rivers of London walk with their spouse, which one would be the most romantic in your opinion? Um, that's interesting, isn't it? Because for me, if I just looked at it from my point of view, I think the most romantic for me would be the River Fleet because you start on Hampstead Heath and you go through a bit of Hampstead and then dropping around the back of sort of King's Cross and then you're into the kind of Farringdon region, which I love, and you've got all the stories of the old pleasure gardens and the springs and all that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure that fits most people's idea of what's romantic though. So of the Lost Rivers walks that I've done, I would say romantic in the traditional sense would probably be the Tyburn because it, you know, you go through the, some of the, um, you go through some lovely parks. Again, you're starting up in Hampstead and then you're ending down a, in sort of Pimlico, Victoria area. Um, and, you, and you walk through Mayfair and all of that. And I did, I did it in uh, winter and it's very, it's a lovely walk in the winter. I really like that part of London in the winter. So it'd probably be the Tyburn or actually, I mean, the Walbrook for me as well would be I would class it as romantic, but I don't think it's kind of like a romantic in a spouse type way. It depends on your spouse, obviously. Uh, who are your favorite 
current YouTube creators? That's a really interesting question because I do change a bit, partly because sometimes my favorite creators stop making videos. There's a guy called John Zahorian who makes amazing uh, hiking videos in America. He does those really long distance trails and I really love his videos. They're really beautifully filmed and uh, I really like his style. And he just, not only did he stop making YouTube videos, but he removed all his videos from YouTube. So you couldn't even go back and watch them all again. Um, do you know what's interesting? I probably don't watch the YouTube channels that you imagine I would do. So I don't really watch many of the people who do, are in the same sort of, I don't know, category. I don't really know what category I'm in. So for example, I don't, you know, I, I don't really watch um, many walking videos anymore. I used to watch a lot of hiking, American hiking videos. I really like Sean James Cameron's uh, allotment channel. It's really, I really love to see Sean's uh, gardening uh, videos and I've, you know, applied some of that to my own garden. So that's been really useful. Obviously I like cruising the car. I think that's the one that probably a lot of my viewers also like. I really enjoy cruising the car. There's a guy I've been watching a lot lately, recently actually. Uh, he did a, a month of vlogging in August and he's got um, an autistic son who's like 16, I think, a guy called Kevin Chapman. And I find him a very engaging character. So I watch Kevin's vlogs, which is interesting. I watch a lot of um, camera reviews and things like, I, I love camera equipment. So that's interesting that you probably wouldn't imagine being what brought you here. And you probably wouldn't be interested in those cameras, but there's a great guy called Kai, who I started watching years ago. He did um, a channel called Digital Rev TV in Hong Kong and he's moved back to the UK and he's continued doing his camera videos here but he, he incorporates a lot of humour into it. I'm a big football fan as some of you will know and I'm a Liverpool fan and that's massively disappointing and slightly perplexing to some of you. That can be for another q and It's a very simple story. So I watch, <laughs> I watch a lot of Liverpool fan channels on my YouTube homepage, probably half of them right, are football related. Red Men TV, uh, the Blood Red podcast which is the Liverpool Echo and then I also watch a brilliant, a brilliant um, podcast, which is on YouTube called Under the Cosh. And it's mostly lower league footballers talking about their careers. It's brilliant. It's highly addictive. I'll easily watch two and a half hours of that all the way through. Um, so they're probably the main ones I watch. I mean, I like all of David John's channels, not just his um, Cruising the Cut channel, but I also really like Bandemonium. I occasionally watch a little bit of Abby Barnes. Abby does a lot of hiking in really lovely locations in the UK. The top of my head I think they're, they're the main ones that come to me off the top of my head I'll put more in the description if I can think of them but yeah is the Thames the deepest river I have no idea how do you get your beard, your beard looking so full of magnifique again I have no idea soap and water this is really nice. It's quite, there's a quite a long thing about how someone discovered my videos during lockdown. I think that's when a lot of people discovered my channel. It's when I experienced a big growth in subscribers. Uh, so that was very gratifying to see that the, the videos were not just enjoyable for me to do and for me to make, but they were also had some sort of utility to other people and value to people in that you know, very difficult period. Um, and he says, how does it feel to have inspired others to see the previously mundane world around them in such a different light? Now, it feels like I'm reading things out where I'm being uh, complimented, so I don't want it to come across that way. But that is partly the purpose of the, of the channel in a way. I think, why have I been doing this? And it goes back to um, work I was doing before YouTube existed. And the beginnings of this YouTube channel was out of a sort of psychogeographic project to do with my sister. It was funded by the Arts Council back in 2004, 2005. So when YouTube started, end of 2005, I put some videos on here at the beginning of 2006 that we'd made for that project. And part of that was to try and introduce new, new ways of looking at the built environment to people who might not be looking at it that way, but also from our point of view to capture people's observations. People are looking at the world that way and how do you record other people's observations of their environment? So um, that's, it's very gratifying. Every time I hear that somebody says, they watched a video and then they went out and did a walk or they're inspired to walk where they are. After watching one of my videos, I feel like in a way that's like job done. You know, I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve, not just uh, in YouTube videos, but actually in my work in general, really. So it's beyond gratifying to hear that. So thank you very much. Uh, when are you going to walk the New River Path? So I've been talking about walking the whole of the New River Path. I think it was my intention at one point to do it all in one day. Uh, it's it's quite long, isn't it? It's uh, 30 something miles. 
In reality, that's, if I were to try attempt that, it would have to be midsummer, so I've got the maximum amount of daylight. Um, so I think in reality, I'll try and split it over two walks. I might even have a go at it this winter, actually. If I'm going to do it over two legs, two, two 20 miles, I still have to start really early in the morning, or it might have to be next summer now, I'm afraid. But who knows, I might just grip me one more. I might just be awake at seven in the winter and go, I'm going to do it today. Today's the day. So this is actually one that came via WhatsApp from my cousin. She saw the, uh, the call out for questions on, uh, on Instagram and then she's um, replied to me on WhatsApp. And it's a really curious uh, message, actually. Um, so it says, I've just seen your message about question about London. The first licensed victuallers society, Christine is a teacher, or the head teacher of the licensed victuallers school. And she said that our first one was in... Um, was in Kennington. Anyway, we had a back and forth and she sent me a picture and actually it turns out it was just off the old Kent Road and it's a beautiful building that I passed on my walk along the River Peck and at the time I'm not sure if I knew what it was and then I looked it up afterwards and saw that it had been the Licensed Victuallers Society Asylum and now it's flat but it has the original chapel which has been restored and is rented out as a venue so that's really beautiful building and it's a really curious story because that school I don't know where that school is now I should look at, I think it's now in Ascot but it moved around a little bit in London but what it really brought up as well is when Christine said it was in um, in Kennington it made me remember some of the really quite grand buildings that, that were in Kennington that are in Kennington and I worked down there for a few months a couple of years ago a few years ago now and I went walking on lunch times and I saw these buildings I was like who knew these incredible buildings were in the back streets of Kennington and what were they and so uh, there was a period of time where I was trying to work out which one of these might have been the school before I realised, oh no, it's that place I walked past when I walked the River Peck. And Christine asked another one, also the painting Gin Alley. Is there any connection with Gin Alley in Camden? Um, no. <laughs> Gin Alley is St Giles, so it's right near Centrepoint, basically. It's the area around Centrepoint. And if you really want to locate it, the Angel Pub, I think, is contemporaneous with the painting, Hogarth's painting of Gin Alley. So you could go in, you could go in the, um, you could go in the Angel and kind of sample a little bit of Hogarth's London. Fifty-two questions on my YouTube channel. There's no way I'm going to get through all of these in one video. It's now half an hour till sunset. We're going to lose the light. Any tips for researching obscure subject matter in libraries, online, etc.? Have you found any good resources that have helped your research? Many thanks for the content. Um, well, there's there's lots. So if you're looking at this generally, here's a good general um, source: is look at old borough or council histories. Most councils produce some sort of official history of their area, usually in the early part of the 20th century. So a lot of them are published around 90, between sort of 1920 and the mid-1930s. They are great sources of information about where you live. They often include maps, they include business directories, and they include what they see as being the official history of that area, which is wouldn't pass for any kind of official history today. It often includes a lot of the kind of more romantic stories about the area. Highly recommend them. Really easy one if you want to research a place where you live. The website britishhistoryonline.ac.uk. I'll put it up on the screen here. That's great. You have to kind of sometimes um, sort of sift through a lot of information that may not be of interest, but there's some absolute gems in there that, again, I've, you find difficult to find in printed sources. And I would say just go to your local studies archive. Every borough in London certainly has one. I think probably most districts in the UK have one. Um, and just go in there and ask them for the materials that you're looking for, ask them for the old maps, the Ordnance Survey maps. Some of them have maps that predate the Ordnance Survey, and the old um, records and accounts, the old newspapers of your area, they're great sources, fantastic. This is a good question. I've only read the first line, and I'm pretty sure I don't know the answer to this. Are there any places left that were settings in Jane Austen's novels, not movie locations? I especially wonder about the church where Lydia Bennett married uh, Wickham in Pride and Prejudice. That's a really good question. I've never read a complete Jane Austen novel. There you go. I didn't study English literature beyond GCSE level, so I, I only got 100 pages into uh, Pride and Prejudice and not even that far into Sense and Sensibility. I have no idea. But they're not in London, uh, as far as I'm aware. I think Jane Austen country is sort of Dorset, isn't it? So, and I'm not very familiar with Dorset. I would say, almost certainly, 
uh, that some of those locations would uh, still be in existence. They would have been renamed in the books, but I'd be, I'd be shocked if some of them didn't exist. It's not that long ago in the uh, overall span of history. Any suggestions on non-fiction books that look at the history, landscape and things and around London? I've already read The Lost Rivers, your wonderful book, but looking for more. Uh, any of Ian Sinclair's London books <laughs> are fantastic. Um, I highly recommend. Um, I, my favourite source, if you want to read about the topography and landscape of London, are uh, go on uh, Abe Books and eBay and look for old topographical books of London. That's my primary source, actually. And I still use those books a lot. So you're looking for pre-war books about London. And there are, there's lots of them, of people making their journeys around London, walking around London, and they're great sources of information. Um, I'll write a list below of any other contemporary books. I mean, there's quite a lot, actually. You've got uh, Rachel Lichtenstein's books about London are fantastic. Will Ashen's book about open forest is great. Um, Tom Bolton's Lost Rivers books are really good if you want an actual literal walking guide. Um, and there'll be others that I can't think of right now off the top of my head, but um, yeah. Let's go, let's go back to a, a wide shot. I apologize now if my eyeline's strained to the fold out screen. It's very difficult not to check it. So I'm also checking to see how well exposed I am in this light. It would be interesting to learn about some of your favorite walks and the reasons behind them. Also you seem to find Epping Forest and surrounding areas magical as we do. M more on the appeal would be great. The, the appeal of Epping Forest and of similar landscapes, I think is, the appeal of the forest really is a place of sanctuary, a place to kind of escape from the city, if you like. I mean, where I'm sat now is technically part of Epping Forest. This was waste on the forest edge. It is still Corporation of London land and part of Epping Forest. So I think it is that, like from my front door, I can walk away from the urban realm and very quickly be in a very different environment and be away from everything, be away from all the pressures of city life, be away from the sounds of city life. And it's just an escape into another realm, really. And it feels slightly timeless, although it's not technically. Um, it's quite a managed environment. This here is quite a managed environment as well, as is the forest. I think that's the appeal of those kind of spaces. And likewise, edgeland spaces, which are almost accidental. You know, they, they've got their own kind of ecology, got their own, um, they've got their own nature that is, has come up as a consequence of how they've been used over time and they feel unofficial uh, in a way that like a forest environment is managed to look the way it looks, right? And no one's really managing edgelands to look the way they look. They're just, they're just a kind of byproduct of their utility. So that's, I think, part of the appeal of those spaces. And you don't find many people in those places. Not that I want to get away from people, but it is nice to get away from the hustle and bustle of city life and to look beneath the surface slightly. This is a good question. I mean, they're all good questions. <laughs> um, I'm having to skip a few, so I'm going to try and go back and answer them an another time because there's a lot. I've got probably, I don't know, 80 odd questions. Um, have, you, have you thought of doing walks around some of the very eclectic and interesting buildings of London, e.g. Crossness Pumping Station or Strawberry Hill House? Um, I did set out to go to Strawberry Hill House, actually, on the walk I did in Patrick Keeler's London. So I did that walk from Vauxhall um, back, I don't know, 2018. So I'll link, again, I'll link to that below. Um, and I ran out of daylight and I couldn't get to Strawberry Hill House. Crossness Pumping Station, I recorded an episode of my radio show there actually with Nick Pabdimitro, 2014, and we never finished, we never did any more episodes. We never finished the season. It was gonna be season three of our radio show. And um, we were invited to do a tour there. And so I recorded the audio of it and I keep meaning to edit that and put it out and I never get around to doing it. Um, you couldn't really just go for a walk there because it's, um, you know, you have to be invited in. It's not open to the public and you'd obviously have to ask their permission to film there. Um, and people do film at Crossness as well. So yeah, definitely. Uh, but I think the, I'd slightly interpret your question as well is would I do uh, videos which are just focusing on a location rather than a walk? And I think that's something I would like to do. And, you know, write to these organisations, get consent to look around the buildings and film there. That'd be a really good thing to do. Um, I like the start of this question. I don't know where it's going. Hello, John. Your walks would make a great TV series. I would watch it. Would you consider doing something like that? And have you ever been approached by any production companies to do a pilot? I would love to have my own TV show. <laughs> Surprise. Someone actually approached me at the beginning of this year. Same sort of question. And I said, I'd love to do it, but I just can't see it being commissioned. Uh, because this type of program is always done by somebody sort of well-known, you know. Um, 
And uh, so this guy said, well, actually, I'm happy to pitch it. Um, it had a production company. So I shot, uh, I didn't shoot anything new. I just cut together, you know, like we call a taster tape, um, just showing what I had to offer. And he pitched it to a few channels. Um, it didn't get, well, it didn't get taken up. Otherwise I'd be saying it got taken up. Um, but then again, it didn't go to that many stations. So I'm, I'd love to do it. If anyone has any influence in that area, if you have a production company, you'd like to work with me on a pilot, I'm well up for it. In my past, I did briefly work as a, as a development producer. It was my job to kind of come up with ideas for TV shows. So I've kind of went through that kind of process a little bit myself. And I suppose that made me slightly uh, not wary of it, but you know, I'm, I'm not a starry eye thinking that it's a nailed on. I think it would work well during daytime. <laughs> That's my pitch to a commissioning editor. How about a bit of daytime TV, me going, taking people on a walk? Come on. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we've got time for a few more before we, before we lose the light. Great to have a question from, from an old friend uh, who watches the YouTube videos. Thank you so much to everyone who watches my YouTube videos. Um, okay, so he starts off saying, okay, let's see, what, let's see if this makes it into the video. I think, I think you submitted one to the previous video and I didn't answer it perhaps. Um, I always feel bad about that. So that's why I think I'm gonna to attempt to answer every question and spread it over as many videos as it takes. Um, what one mile distance will you never tire of walking? Fantastic question. And I would say it's the mile over Wanstead Flats. I do never tire of walking it. I've walked it so many times and it, I will never get tired of it. This, um, this is a, there's a couple of questions within one question, but it's a really, there's a really intriguing question here that I'm gonna to have to work out the answer to as we, as we sit here now. What's the longest and most interesting walk you've done from London without relying on public transport? I mentioned it before, I walked from my front door to Hartford in Hertfordshire. Um, and I think that's my longest walk that I've recorded, 32 miles, I think it came out. How many boroughs have you walked through in a single day? Which areas of London feature in a second book? Now, it used to be a question actually, but I want to put together like a topographical race, they, which they used to do. The London Explorers, um, what they call the London Explorers Club, formed by William Margrey in the 1920s, they used to have these challenges. And I thought, well, what would be a good topographical race? And one of them would be the shortest route, which covers the most boroughs. So you'd have to find an area where lots of boroughs meet. Um, I don't know the most, I mean, I've, what's, I've walked across London from here. I walked from here to Paddington one day. So that would be um, Waltham Forest, Hackney, Tower Hamlets, City of London, if you count that as a borough, London Borough of Camden, and then Paddington is in Kensington and Chelsea, I think, isn't it? So that's six. I think you'd be hard pressed to, I mean, but you could, do that in a small area if you just went through sort of Camden you know in the center of London you can tick off a few can't you can go oh I went through Islington on that walk as well so you could go Islington you actually if you start down City Road you could go Hackney Islington Camden you could do that in a really short if you walked from Hoxton Square to King's Cross which is not a very long walk you go through three boroughs straight away there then you could go to Kensington Chelsea cross the river and do Southwark, Lambeth, but then it kind of gets a bit tricky because they cover such a big area. So I think it's probably about six. Yeah, probably about six boroughs. Standard in and a, a long London walk would be three because the London boroughs are quite big. There's a few small ones. Islington's an easy one because it's sort of long and narrow, isn't it? But um, which areas of London feature in your second book? Thank you. I have finished the second book. It's currently with the publisher who published my first book. Um, they've had it for a while now, I've not heard anything yet, so I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get a little bit, mm, it's a bit ominous. Um, which areas feature? So, um, Leytonstone, the Lee Valley, Epping Forest, um, uh, Hackney, Stratford, the Olymp around the, a lot of it centres around the Olympic Park, um, Peckham, is in there, there's a big chunk on Peckham. Um, where else? Um, some areas of North London in the London Borough of Barnet. There's a couple of chapters that concern the London Borough of Barnet. Uh, where else? Where else? Where else? Oh, now I'm struggling a little bit. Um, Battersea, I think, is a bit of Battersea, and a few other areas like the air. Yeah, so it's a, it's not a topographical book in the sense the first one was. So I'm not consciously I can do a, a, a geographical spread. I was following the stories really and following the characters more than looking at it in terms of the actual locations themselves. Although there is a consequently a really good geographical spread. I'm actually getting munched by mosquitoes right here at the moment. My ear, particularly my ear.
like this question. I like all the questions, <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, has there been any place on any of your wanderings which has made you feel a little bit spooked out? By this I mean a place even felt a little bit otherworldly, ghost story-ish, or just plain haunted as if you had wandered into an Arthur Mackin-esque London or something similar. That's intriguing, isn't it? Um, I think you definitely get elements of that, and that's really obvious, but like I think Highgate Cemetery does have something about it, which I've been to all but one of the magnificent London cemeteries, and it's the only one that has a slightly eerie feeling. I actually, to be honest with you, not so much the cemetery, but Swain's Lane. I've walked up there at night, and it's the lane that runs beside Highgate Cemetery, an old lane. That's got, that's got a vibe to it. It really has got a vibe to it that's, yeah, very intriguing. So I would say that's one of the key ones. In terms of other places where you get a bit spooked out, I don't tend to get spooked out, to be honest with you. Um, one of the kind of eerie places was um, Twyford Abbey, and there's an abandoned farm in the grounds of the old Twyford Abbey. Um, I think it's now in the process of being turned into luxury apartments, and I went in there with my friends Peter Knapp, Peter Knapp and um, Nick Papadimitri, and I made a film, I'll link to it below. And that had a very eerie feel, because it was just like this old abandoned farm right next to the North Circular. And I had an account of it from an old topographical book where it describes what it was like when it was still a working farm. So it was kind of, that was a very eerie place. That was a very eerie place indeed. <laughs> Chaz and Dave fan, question, Gercha? Not really, <laughs> if I was totally honest. John, you strike me as a man who knows his pubs. Thank you very much, I'll take it as a compliment. What's your favorite historic pub in London and why? What's your favorite all round pub, all the best Richard? Uh, well, I'll answer, uh, actually, hmm. so I could combine both answers in one question. Um, my favorite all round pub is the one I'm gonna go to in a minute. My wife actually is on her way over once to flats with my son to meet me, and we're gonna go to the Red Lion. And the Red Lion is a historic pub. I just did a actually, guided walk around Leightonstone. Um, around the town centre and the Red Lion is on that because it's the site of a, a coaching inn that dates back to the late 17th century. Current building isn't that old, I think it's sort of turn of the century or late Victorian. But it's a historic location, it's an old coaching inn. And it's a great pub, I really like it, I really like the vibe in there, I really like the beer, I really like the general ambience in there, I really enjoy it. But if I wanted to choose a kind of like tourist kind of historic pub, I'd probably say the Princess Louise on High Holborn. Um, because it really has retained the feel of a gin palace. I mean, it is an old gin palace, and I know they've done some work to kind of like restore it back to how it was. So that's a really great historic pub. Also, the Angel that I mentioned earlier is like that. Um, to be honest with you, it's a lot of them are Samuel, Samuel Smith's pubs. Um, the Lyceum Tavern's a, a great historic pub. I mean, the famous ones are the Cheshire Cheese and the City of York, aren't they? But I probably been to those pubs like a handful of times. Also the Mitre off Hatton Garden is a great historic pub. I haven't been there for years though, but that's a really historic pub as well. There's a few in there for you <laughs> to choose from. We've still got audio? Yes, still got audio. Somebody here has asked for more walks around cemeteries. I think that would be a really good thing to do. I'm just um, done a project. I've just done a project for a, a group called Advantages of Age, where I've recorded audio guides of uh, London cemeteries. I will link to that below. Um, by the time you watch this, I think only one of them is online at the moment, but within a couple of weeks, there'll be three of them online, and I'm, I'm very happy with them actually. So I'll link to those below. It's a good question, actually. It's an intriguing question. Do you think anyone would try to replicate um, Crystal Palace, even on a scaled-down version? Heard any rumours? Um, no, I don't. And I think one of the reasons I think we wouldn't see anything like that is they did try to do a pleasure garden during the Olympics. Do you remember? And it was down near the Royal Docks, and it was a total failure. And it got mothballed, and it was lane derelict for a couple of years. So I think that was probably a kind of a little bit of a lesson to people trying to do something on that scale. Now it's very hard to do. I'm not entirely sure why it failed, but it did. And I think, I think that would be something that would put anybody off trying to do something like that. And at one point they were looking at doing something similar in uh, Battersea Power Station, and again, never got off the ground, did it? And now Battersea Power Station is just going to be apartments. So I don't think anyone would. You know, I could say sadly, but I don't know if it is such a bad thing, to be honest with you. This is interesting. Um, so someone said that they, um, I really enjoy your river walks. And so they've said, um, have you considered writing a book about rivers, lost or otherwise? Because a river hunter, you know your stuff, I would make a great read. 
I certainly wouldn't do a Lost Rivers book because I think that's well covered now. You have obviously the Nicholas Barton and Tom Bolton's written his two volumes of Lost Rivers books. There's also a great book by Tim Bradford, which people often forget about, called The Groundwater Diaries. So I think Lost Rivers is kind of done. Underground London, I think, is an, become an oversaturated part of the London genre. I think there's another book coming out soon about under London. And there's, I mean, you could fill a shelf of books about under London. Um, so I think we're well covered there. Rivers, do you know what's interesting? There is a book called English Rivers by an author called John Rogers. It's mad, isn't it? I think it was written in the 1940s. Um, river walks, you, English river walks would be a good topic to do. Maybe I would in the future. I've got a couple of other ideas for actually for books about areas outside London. So I'm not gonna say what they are on here, but I would do those first and they're less, ob less obvious. Well, they're the things I haven't done in my videos. There you go. So, um, but yeah, I'd love to walk more UK rivers. Um, but it'd be very helpful to me to write a book called English Rivers when one by John Rogers already exists. <laughs> interesting about my process of making videos this is the only question I've seen so far about my, my, my process uh, John you speak so fluently whilst filming and walking thank you very much uh, do you have a script worked on beforehand or are you able to research your places and freestyle the commentary it's very impressive thank you very much um, sorry I don't really mean to read out the compliments but the process is I, I definitely don't have a script what I do have for my most of the time not all the, not all the videos are made in the same way but when I make a decision about where to go, I have to know why. So I say, well, what's the point of this video? What's the story? What's the narrative underpinning it? And so I, I kind of think about that first. On occasions I've written it down, but most of the time it's enough for me just thinking in my head, I'm going here because this is the reason. And obviously I'm taking you along, right? So I have to know why I would want to take you along on this walk. I have to know why I want to do it. Even if it's just that, oh, well, I don't really know. I've heard about this place. It could be interesting. For example, the video I filmed yesterday is actually a little bit of a contradiction. I went to Shoebriness at the end of the Thames Estuary, and obviously what I was heading for there was the Ministry of Defence estates. There's the old garrison, and then there's the wakering stairs which lead to the Broomway, the, the deadliest path in Britain. This will be the next video, by the way. And uh, I had no notes other than I had a few notes about the Ministry of Defence land there, but that was it. The rest of it I kind of gathered as I went. A few little bits and bobs, but most of the time what I'm doing lately is I am writing about a page of bullet points and then I, sometimes I look at them, sometimes I just see what I can remember and I quite like freestyling it. What I don't do very well is I don't think, you know, I don't think I'm at my best when I'm just reciting facts and figures to you. I would rather try and remember it and get it wrong and then either correct it on the screen or just leave it there actually and then let you fill in the gaps in the comments um, than I would try and recite a spiel. I don't think that's, that's not really what I want to do. Um, I like to keep it fluid. I want to keep it conversational. I want to keep it humane. I don't think there's any point in me just reading out a Wikipedia entry. You can do that for yourself. So um, I like to, that's why I like to include anecdote and misrememberings. And I sometimes include mistakes. You think, don't remember, these are edited. So when, for example, the other week, when I couldn't remember the other of the Magnificent Seven Cemeteries, obviously <laughs> I can look that up and put it on the screen. But the point is I didn't know at the time. So I'd rather leave that and, and people do know and people did comment and that's more authentic than me you know doing it. so it's a bit of a mish a bit of a mishmash a bit of both but they're certainly not scripted uh do you have any secret little walks that you like to keep to yourself that's interesting um although it's reasonably well known i love nunhead cemetery for walks i never tell anyone else a little about it uh well in a way i kind of blew it because my sort of secret walk that i like to keep to myself was my walk around Wanstead flats and around Wanstead park and then i made the video about it in the at the beginning of this year actually because I thought it was inevitable that I would do that. So that's really it. Um, most of my personal walks, I would just do my little sort of, you know, local loops, so to speak. I think I have actually videoed most of them now. The thing I'm probably going to keep to myself and try not to make a video of is the village where I grew up in Wibham Green. Although I've touched on a couple of videos, sort of ended walks there. I've not done a kind of walk around Wibham Green. Although I'm thinking of making a video of the river that runs through Wibham which basically runs through most of the village. It's not a particularly big village. So then I would be making a video about Wuben. Um, so there you go. So I don't know, maybe I will have no, at the moment that's still sort of like secret walk I keep to myself, but probably not for long. Someone's just asked, what's my favorite stretch of the Lee? 
Um, it would be, well, it's a big stretch of the Lee and it's the bit, <laughs> it's the bit between um, Waltham Abbey and Hartford. It's just a long stretch of the River Lee, but that's by far and away my favourite bit of the River Lee. I love it. It's just glorious. Just, just, I barely have words to describe how great it is. Uh, this is a question I get asked a bit, actually. It's a good question and it will never go away. Have you ever, um, uh, I've lost the question. Have you ever uh, you considered using dowsing to help you pinpoint underground stretches? Um, I, when I did the remapping High Wycombe project uh, all those years ago, um, we were going to do uh, a, something with the dowsers, try and help find the location of the Holy Well. Um, there was a kind of new agey shop in Wickham, which I think it might still be there. It's near the station. I think it's on Crendon Street. That's my wife. Hang on a moment. Hello, darling. We were going to use a dowser in Wickham to help find the Holy Well, and it never happened. I can't remember why. And since then, I haven't. Um, does it work? I'm not. I mean, it's a quirky thing to do for a project. It'd be good to do a walk, a Lost River walk with a dowser, actually. I mean, we do kind of have maps we can use it, don't we? So, source is a river. It'd be good for you finding the source of a river, I think. Have you ever traveled down to De Cornwall and Devon? Some amazing walks around there, even better when you go off track. Yes. Ah, I've not really been to Cornwall. My dad lives in North Devon. Um, I keep meaning to do a video with my dad. I did film a little video with my dad, actually, that I never ended up editing and using. Uh, maybe I should do that and post it something. But I love walking around North Devon, yeah. Um, it's really, it's stunning, absolutely stunning, yeah. Oh, okay, this is a good, I think my wife and my son are over there somewhere. They're gonna, find me here and, and force me to go to the red line. So I think this is a good question to end this part of the filming of these questions. I might try and film some more tomorrow and then any other questions I haven't done, I'll record in another video. Um, first, uh, da, da, da. so this is interesting. Do you know the origins of the village name Flackwell Heath? To Flack well, this is interesting. Being um, my birth village and being a local, I just wondered, well, I grew up in the village next beneath Flackwell Heath. Wooban Green is a village in Buckinghamshire. Flackwell Heath often used to claim to be the biggest village in England. I think there are a few that claim a similar, um, similar heritage. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the origins of Flackwell Heath. What I do know is it was synonymous with cherry orchards for a long time. That was sort of like what it was known for. Um, I am currently working on a piece of writing which looks a little bit at that area actually without giving too much away. So I will look into the origins of Flackwell Heath, but obviously it would be a well. I mean, that goes without saying, doesn't it? And there were a lot of ponds in Flackwell Heath. Um, I don't know if there are any now. I think they've been filled in. My dad tells a story of um, the Flackwell Heath supporters were, were quite rough uh, back in the day and of the football club there. And there's a story, my dad tells a story of when they, if they didn't like the referee, they'd throw the referee in the pond near the football ground. There is no pond in that football ground now, so I wonder if that was why it was filled in. Here's, um, here's Joseph behind my, my, my youngest son. So now I'm gonna have to go to the Red Lion, to one of my favorite historic pubs, but we will, I will finish answering all your questions. I won't leave questions unanswered.